Okay, good evening, everyone. And we are holding here in Pasha's Chukas, which has one of the most tragic episodes in the entire Chumash. Moshe Rabbeinu has been leading Klal Yisrael by this time in history for 40 years in the Midbar. This is the very end of the 40-year cycle. And they are standing on the edge of Eretz Yisrael. They are about to embark on the rest of the history of the Jewish people, where they're going to end up building a base on Migdash, living a life of Ruchnius, of Amuna, Bitochen, and Hashem. And Moshe Beinu is the undisputed leader, which we understand. He's led them through everything. He's going to lead them into Eretz Yisrael as well. There's no doubt about that. There's nothing really holding Moshe back from becoming that Moshe, that savior of Klal Yisrael that's going to lead them into the Holy Land. Until we get to this week's Pasha. And it is perhaps one of the saddest and most incomprehensible things that takes place throughout the Chumash that Moshe Rabbeinu, master of Chachma, master of Torah, Pe'al pe, mouth to mouth with the Rebbeinu Sha'ilam, face to face, he receives his nevuah. As we mentioned, I believe, in the last year that we learned together, the anivos, the humility of Moshe Rabbeinu was something that was beyond legendary. It was on the level of Malachim, on the level of the angels. And I just want to share with you a few words of the Ramban in his famous Igeris, his famous letter, just to understand what a humble person should be able to accomplish. The Ramban is, is explaining in the very beginning that the worst midah, the worst trait that a person could have in the world is something called kas, called anger. And a person has to stop at all costs, or not stop at all costs. Just trying to make sure you're paying attention, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it says not stop at all, not at stop any at any cost in order to avoid even the smallest measure of cause of anger in their life. And the Ramban is talking to his son over here and he explains the following. And he says, Haser kas milibecha, you must remove kas, all anger, from your flesh, from who you are. And then you will remove all bad and all negativity from you. And it speaks about Gehenim, you'll get, you'll get out of Gehenim in such a way. And he says, when a person rescues themselves from anger, they will then achieve the level and the need of the trait of a nova of humility. Humility is the greatest trait from all of the traits that a human being could possibly have. Shinemar, and he goes on to explain. Now that means, and the Ramban will explain better, that a person's first goal in life is to get rid of any anger. When you have no anger, what does anger come from? Anger comes because somebody is pressing my buttons. Somebody is going against what I think is the right way. Somebody is embarrassing me. Somebody is defaming me. Somebody is disappointing me. Somebody stepped on my toes, and therefore I get angry. When you get past all of that, you go into the stratosphere of a love of humility. A person who is living a life of humility, he's not going to get angry because nothing is going to bother him. No one no situation, no hand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends them, nothing will cause even an ounce of anger to well up in this person because he's living by another with humility. He is mevatel, he nullifies himself to the will of Hashem. Moshe Beinu was anav mikol adam apne adam. He was the humblest of all men that ever existed in the history of the world. If Moshe Rabbeinu was the humblest of all men, that means that it's impossible that there could be a trace of anger in Moshe Rabbeinu. Impossible. Because that's what the Ramban is saying. The Ramban is saying is that when you live in the world of humility, 
anger is is a foreign object to you. It doesn't it doesn't even enter into your mind. So Moshe Venu, humblest of all men, he knew his greatness. Yet he was mavatel himself. He subjugated himself to the will of Hashem. It's impossible that such a man who's more of a malach, more of an angel than a human being, it's impossible that such a person could get angry. And yet in this week's parsha, sadly, Moshe Benu gets angry. And it's, it's, it's a, a momentary lapse of anger, but it's a lapse of anger that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, sorry, you can't go to Eretz Yisrael. We're leaving you in the Midbar, in the wilderness. You will die there like the other, may say Midbar, like the other people who died in the wilderness. Only the generation that's worthy of it is going to pass over the borders and go into the Holy Land. But because you did what you did, and we'll see in the, in the Chumash, what it is that it caused in Klal Yisrael, what it is that it caused in the world, therefore, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you lost the schos of anava, of humility, you entered into the realm of kas, of anger, and as a result of that, I can't let you go to Eretz Yisrael. All of the Mephorshim, without fail, on the Chumash, they all ask the question, how is it possible that Moshe Rabbeinu was able to get himself into a situation where he got angry at the Jewish people? They've done everything to him over the last 40 years. They complained, they fetched, they argued, they bothered him, they, they whined, they did everything that a nice that, 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 that we would expect from the Jewish people. And not once did Moshe Benu get angry, not once. He maybe got frustrated, maybe he fell on his face and he got into Hashem, maybe he asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, why'd you take me over here to take the Jewish people out? What do you want from me? But he never, in 40 years as the leader of Klal Yisrael, not once did he exhibit a single angry remark to any of the Jewish people, not once. Not to Paroi, who was trying to kill him, not to Dustin and Navira, now we're always out to get him, not to anyone. There was not a trace of anger. How come at the last moment, as they're about to enter Eretz Yisrael, how come Moshe Beinu falls prey to the mid of Kas of anger? So Rav Hirsch, in his beautiful way that he looks at Pesukim and he understands the Chumash, he offers the following approach to understanding the, the sin of the of the of the Meimeriva, of these waters of contention, these waters of strife, to be able to understand why Moshe Benu did what he did. And he says over the following idea. He said, we have to read the Psukim to understand. Hashem says to Moshe Benu the following. He says, can you maybe shut the back door? Thank you. Yeah. What? No, thank you. I don't want to get angry. <laughs> okay. The Pasuk says like this. It says, Moshe said to Hashem said to Moshe, you can come, you can come this way, you can come sit on the other side. You see what you're missing on Zoom? I think nobody comes to Shem anymore, everybody comes. Now, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, take the staff and gather the nation together. You and your brother Aaron, speak to the rock in the eyes of the Jewish people. 
Venasan Mevav, and the rock will give forth its waters miraculously. Vaitsay you bring out water from the rock. And you'll, you'll replenish and you'll nourish the community and their animals. So Vayikach Moshe Samate. Moshe Rabbeinu then takes the mati, takes the staff. That Milifnei Hashem, before HaKadosh Baruch HaShet Tzivah, they, they command him. Says of Hirsch, when was the last time Moshe Rabbeinu was carrying a staff in the Midbar? We haven't heard about this mantra, this staff, in a very long time. When was the last time that Moshe Benu had the staff in his hand before it was put away in the Mishkan and it was stayed there to rest? Paro. Paro? Close? Korach. Korach, no. Long before. The last time he touched a rock to get water up? No. A little after that? Yamsif. What? Yamsif. After that? Is this the same staff that blew up blossomed almonds for Aaron yesterday, last week? No, that was Aaron. That was Aaron's staff. Tomorrow water. What? Tomorrow water. A little after that? The one that uh, they put a snake on the top and they said they look at it and you feel. Right? The after that? After what? No, that was early, earlier. So after that? Oh. Um, who said it, Malik? Oh. oh. Very good. Tamida, yeah? Okay. So the Pasuk says in Parshas B'Shalach, which is after Kriyas Yamsuf, which is when Klal Yusuf is heading into the into their journeys in the, in the Midbar, in the wilderness, and they get attacked by the nation of Amalek. It says in the Pasuk over there, the verse says the following, Moshe told Yeshua, let's choose men that will come out to fight. Tomorrow I'm going to stand on the head of this mountain. And the staff of God is going to be in my hands. You know how long ago that was? That was 40 years ago. The last time that Moshe Benu took the staff in his hand to make signs and wonders for Klal Yusuf was 40 years ago. But why did he have to do it 40 years ago? Because Klal Yusuf did not yet believe in Moshe Benu. They didn't believe that he was the emissary of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They didn't believe that it was worthy to follow HaKadosh Baruch Hu through thick and through thin in everything that he, that he said. So he had to have a mate, he had to have a staff. He had to have his magic wand over there. They could wave. They had to split the sea. The sea splits. They fight the battles against the Moloch. The Moloch falls down to the ground. They have one maka, one plague after the other. You raise the mata. You raise the, the stick. It takes care of everything. After that, HaKadosh Baruch said, put it away. Klal Yisrael, by Yamira Ba'ashem, Moshe they believe in you now. And they believe in me. It's not the staff that makes the miracles. It's not the staff that brings the signs and the wonders. It's the Rebbein Shalom who brings all of that. And you, Moshe, you are my shaliach, you are my messenger. And that means through your word and through your actions, through everything that you do, you are going to facilitate that I will be able to bring the miracles down to this world. <laughs> 40 years goes on like this. And there were many miracles. Mon fell down min HaShemayim. The Be'er Miriam, the well of Miriam, followed them wherever they went. There were Ananiya covered clouds of glory protecting them on all sides. Their enemies fell by the wayside. The clouds would plow over the high mountain ranges, flatten it out so that the Jewish people could go easily through where they had to go. Everything was miraculous in the, in the wilderness, and there was not once in which Moshe Ben had to use the mountain. They're standing now on the edge of Eretz Yisrael. They're about to lose a lot of the nisim, a lot of the miracles that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was doing in the wilderness. They're going to go into Eretz Yisrael. It's going to be a regular day. You want food, you plow the field. You want water, you go to the well. You want clothing, not like it was in the Midbar. In the Midbar, they never, their clothing never wore out. Their shoes were never, they never were worn. 
They wore the same clothing every single day of their lives. It's a woman's nightmare. Could you imagine? <laughs> yeah, well, they wore the same clothing every single day of their lives with one pair of shoes. And they were totally happy. Are you going to come to Eretz Yisrael? Are you going to make your own clothes? You're going to make your own shoes. And they'll wear out. And you have to buy new shoes. And you have to get new clothing. And you have to go back to Amazon.com once again, another time tonight, to make sure you get what you want. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe, Ben Moshe, remember that mantra they used to have? Take it out of the Mishkan right now and go stand in front of the Jewish people. But don't use it. Just talk to the rock. Don't use the mantra. Show them there was a mantra once upon a time that you used in order to show the great strength of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but now everything is according to your word, Moshe. You speak, the waters will flow. You say something, I'll bring the bracha to the world. Don't use the matah, don't use the staff. Says Rav Hirsch, Moshe Benu is very, if Rav Hirsch wouldn't say, we can't say such things because it's, it it's, makes the chumash and it makes <laughs> humanity so real over here. But he says over the following idea, Moshe Benu, at this moment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him to take out the matah, got very hurt by HaKadosh Baruch and Klal Yisrael. Because if I didn't need the matah for 40 years, mm -hmm. it was because there was proof to Klal Yisrael that I'm the emissary of Hashem. And HaKadosh Baruch runs the world. And we don't need magic wands to make, to make miracles take place. If HaKadosh Baruch was telling Moshe Ben to bring out the matah, to bring out the, the, the staff at this moment, Moshe Benu took it as a sign that after all of the 40 years that I was Moshe Nefesh, that I gave up myself for Klal Yisrael, through thick and through thin, and everything that took place. And now Hashem is telling me, bring out the Mata. That means that Klal Yisrael does not trust me and believe in me. And how is it possible that after all this time they don't trust and believe in me? So it says of Hirsch, Again, if he wouldn't say such things, we would never say it. But Rav Hirsch says that at that moment when Moshe Rabbeinu realized that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was sending him the message that if you don't bring out the staff, they're not going to believe you. Because what were they complaining about? Remember, what were they complaining? They were complaining, Moshe and Aaron, where are you? You're draining a cup. Where are you leading us around in the wilderness over here? You're taking us to a place where there's no water? What are you doing? HaKadosh Baruch Hu told you to bring us over here. Must be, it's all must be your own doing. Hashem told you to bring us to a place where there's no water we can't drink. It must be because you and Aaron, your brother, you got lost on the GPS over there. You have no idea where you are. That's why we have no water to drink. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu was telling Moshe Rabbeinu, believe it or not, after all of these years, they still don't trust you and Aaron that you do everything that I tell you to do. And they actually think that you yourselves brought them to a place where there would be no water. They need to know that I'm the one, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who led you, who told you where to go, who told you to stop over here and made it, that Miriam is going to die, the Be'er Miriam, the well is going to vanish out of thin air, and there won't be any water left to drink. It's all me, says Hashem. And Moshe Ben has said, are you kidding me? They actually don't believe in me? They actually don't believe that I care with all of my fiber, with everything that I have inside of my kishkas and my heart and my soul in the life of every single Jew? They don't think that I only do what you want, HaKadosh Baruch Hu? They don't believe that I'm a Navi par excellence who gets a Nebu, like a pipeline through me to do every bidding will of yours, Hashem? They don't believe in that? Says Rav Hirsch, at that moment, Moshe Rabbeinu was so crushed. Again, Rav Hirsch doesn't say it. We can't say it. You'd sound like some Bible critic if you would say such a thing. But Rav Hirsch says he's allowed to. And he says, Moshe Rabbeinu at that moment got such what we would call Chalisha's Hadas. He couldn't believe it. He got very agitated. And he walks over to the Jewish people who are rebel rousing over here. 
and he looks at them, they gathered all the people together by the rock that Hashem told them to speak to. And Moshe Beno, he slips. And he says, Listen to me, Morim, literally, which means rebels. Listen to me. With anger, he's saying, You think we're going to bring water out of this rock over here? And then remember, Hashem told him, Talk to the rock, and the water, the water will flow forth. But Moshe has the staff in his hand, and he's not in a very good mood right now. And he takes the staff and he hits the rock with his staff twice. Not once, but he hits it twice. He wasn't asked to hit it even once. And the many waters started pouring out of the rock and they began drinking and devouring the water that was there. Since that you did not sanctify me in front of the Jewish people, and you did not increase the amuna, the faith of Klal Yisrael, you will not be the ones to bring the Jewish people into Mitzrayim, into the land of Egypt. Says Rav Hirsch over here the following idea. And he explains that it doesn't really mean that they were rebel. We don't see much rebellion of the Jewish people. We see complaining. We see them arguing with Moshe Abeno. But then it's not mutiny on the bounty, not rebelling over here. Rather, what it was is that the Am Kshayor of that same stick neft stick neft stick stiff-necked people that were following Moshe Bain around and bothering the entire time, they did the same thing again. And Moshe Beno, in a moment, a momentary lapse of pure humility, where you believe a humble person believes that everything that is happening in their life is only the Rebbein Shalom. That's what humility means. Humility means that I am willing and I'm able and I'm ready to accept that every single detail in my life is all coming from Hashem. And therefore nothing is going to get me upset. I'm not gonna get angry at Klal Yisrael. I'm not gonna get angry with my wife. I'm not gonna get angry with the Shadchan. I'm not gonna get angry with the rabbi. I'm not gonna get angry with my brother, my sister. I'm not gonna get anybody. Because every little detail that's happening in my life is worked out and tailor-made exactly by Hashem. In this one lapse, that moment in Moshe Beno's career, 40 years of tremendous leadership, 40 years emissary of Hashem, 40 years in Navi on a level, a, a Navi, a prophet on that level cannot make mistakes, otherwise HaKadosh Baruch cannot speak to him. At one moment, he lost a drop of his amuna. that every single thing that was happening in his life was all orchestrated by Hashem. And the fact that Klal Yisrael did not yet trust in him fully, and that's why HaKadosh Baruch told him, take the matta, take the staff, because they need to see that I'm still involved with you. Should not have said, should not have upset Moshe Rabbeinu. On the other hand, Moshe should have said, no, no, that's Klal Yisrael. That's the Jewish people. I just heard a Meister the other day, Rabbi Russell, who was here uh, over um, it's months ago already. He was here for the Chinuch Shabbaton. He said that there was a certain, certain, uh, I don't know, it was a Manayal or a Rebbe in Lakewood where his children were in school that destroyed one of his children, totally destroyed one of his children. This kid went so far off the derech and he felt, he and his wife, they knew the whole story, the inner story. They felt that this particular Rebbe was the one that broke their kid beyond belief and pushed them off. 
So he said he could despise this person beyond belief. And he said, Bashkacha, they dive in the same exact shul. And he said, and where would he sit? He sat in the place about in this direction, Rabbi Russell, that every Shabbos, when they would lift the Sefer Torah up by the Bima, he said, as they're lifting up the Torah, who does he see? He sees that Rebbe right over there. He said, I got to the point, I couldn't even look at the Sefer Torah. Because this person, every time I looked at it, my blood was coddling and boiling. He said, but he got to a certain place in his life where he began looking at everything as Hashkach is Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of everything. He runs the world. He runs everybody's family. So, so be it. If that's supposed to be that this child is going to be off the derech, it's not because it's not the, it's not the Rebbe's fault. HaKadosh Baruch Hu orchestrated all the events. So he said he worked very hard on himself to forgive this man for all of the terrible things that he did to his child. He said, it took me two years. I worked and I worked and I worked all of the anger out of my heart, all of the vengeance, all of the grudge. I worked it all out of my heart. And I finally decided I'm going to go over to this Rebbe and I'm going to tell him, I'm going to ask him, Mechila, I'm going to, I'm going to apologize to him that I was harboring hatred and anger against him for the last two years. So he said he finds the guy and he goes over to him and he says, um, look, I, I just want to apologize to you. So he says, for what? He said, because, you know, Hashem has a very big cheshbon, he has a very big plan. And part of his plan was is that my child was going to be in your school, in your class, and that you were going to do whatever you did to my, to my child, and it would end up pushing him off the derech of Yiddishkeit. And I want you to know that for the last two years, I've been working on myself to get over my anger that I should not hold a grudge against you. And I'm fine now, he said. I hold no grudges. I look at it all as it's between, it's, 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 it's our Kodesh Baruch Hu's world. My child, what happened to him, that's what we have to deal with. Why it is that our Kodesh Baruch Hu shows you to be the one that's going to be pu pushing my child off the derech, that's, that's your cheshmer with our Kodesh Baruch Hu, but it has nothing to do with me anymore. And therefore, I'm, I just want to let you know that I apologize that for the last two years, I was seething and thinking and wishing the worst things in the world upon you. So he says, the Rebbe looks back at him and he says, what took you so long? He said, I could have punched him in the nose mm -hmm. at that point. He said, but I said to myself, you know what? I expect nothing else from you. That's how it is. Moshe Beinu was supposed to see Klal Yusuf complaining. There's no water, Moshe, oh, how could you have taken us over here? I, you're not leading us. You don't know where you're going. Where's HaKadosh Baruch Hu? He should have said, that's Klal Yusuf. What else could I expect of them? They're a slave nation. They came into the, into the Midbar. They're running away from their oppressors. They saw a lot of miracles. They saw a lot of tragedy. They saw a lot over here. They're still the unsure nation of themselves. What could I expect? Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Ya'an lahemantim bi, because you didn't believe fully in me, says Hashem. You didn't trust 100% in me that I'm running the world. <laughs> and that this nation over here, they're just here to chest you. They're just here to press you. They're just here to do what they want. Because that you did not fully have that amuna that the humble man has. Again, on Moshe Benu's level. And again, you have to think about it like this. The Mishnah Pregova says, there are different types of kaisanim, different types of angry people in the world. There are those who get angry easily, and it's very hard to appease them. Chelik Ra, that's a very bad portion a person can have in life. There are those who get angry easily, but they also, they get over it easily. Okay, that's a, that's a better portion. And there are those who rarely, rarely in a billion years, they will not get angry, 
But if they will get angry, they get over it like that. That's a chilek type. That's a good portion that the person has. Moshe Beno never got angry. It seems to be in his life. This one moment over here where he lapsed in the amuna, he lapsed in the anibas and the humility, and he got angry, and all he said was, Shimon Amorim, listen to me, our rebellious people. Hit the rock, and it's over. That's it. That's the end of this display of anger. There's no more. And yet, as we know, that the greater that a person is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, judged them like a hair's breadth, and he came to Moshe Bain and he said, you didn't believe, I didn't believe in Hashem. If a guy hits a rock, believing that water is going to come out of the rock, he <laughs> believes in Hashem. No, no, you didn't believe in me, fool. Because I told you to talk to the rock. I told you to speak to the rock peacefully and calmly, and the water would have brought, and the rock would have brought the waters out. But you allowed yourself to get upset in that moment. Says of Hirsch, since that the mission of Moshe Rabbeinu, all of the years in the Midbar, was to be able to instill the deepest levels of Amunah in Klal Yisrael. Moshe Rabbeinu's mission was to be the Maimon, the great believer in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that any time that he would talk, it was the voice of Hashem was coming through his mouth. It was the Shechina Medaberz Mutoich Groinoi, says in Chazal that the, whenever Moshe Ben opened his mouth to say over the words of Hashem, it wasn't Moshe Ben's voice that you heard. You heard the voice of the Shechina coming out of his mouth, coming out of his throat. <laughs> Moshe Benu built on Klal Yisrael for all of those years to be Maminim, to see the miracles, to see the Chesed, to see the hand of Hashem. And that Moshe Ben was the one that is going to be able to make the transition between living in the Midbar, which was a world of miracles beyond belief, to transitioning into a normal life in the land of Eretz Yisrael. For us, it's the opposite. When you go from America to Eretz Yisrael, so you feel that you're leaving the place where there's no miracles, and you're going to the world where there is miracles, and there's Kedusha, and there's holiness. The greatest amount of holiness that there was in the world, the greatest amount of miraculous things which took place was 40 years in the Midbar. Everything was miraculous. They have to get ready not to live a regular life. If you don't have real amun about Kaddish Baruch, how are you going to live a regular life? If you don't believe that I could plant the seed and Hashem is going to make it that the earth and the nutrients and the water is going to rain down from Shemayim and the sun is going to come and bake the seed that's inside of there and after it will decompose, that's when it's going to grow. If you don't believe that HaKadosh Baruch is the one that is doing all of that, how are you going to farm the land? If you don't believe that you're going to have to fight battles not like clouds of glory surrounding you where the arrows would end up being swallowed up by the clouds, but rather you're going to go into the land and there's going to be seven nations there that you're going to have to go through and destroy each and every one to conquer the land. But you don't believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that's going to help you fight the battles and the wars. How are you going to fight the battle? How are you going to win the war? And therefore, says Rav Hirsch, that on Moshe Rabbeinu's level of Amuna, of the expectations that HaKadosh Baruch had of him, this ends up being a momentary decline in his life of Amuna, and therefore, <coughs> Hashem tells him, you can no longer be the one that is Zeichel that will merit to bring Klal Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael. Because the only thing that, we, that they're going to transfer with them from the wilderness is not the miracles. It's not the signs. It's not the wonders. The only thing that they're going to take with them is Amun Hashem. And this was a small decline and a failure on your part, Moshe Rabbeinu, of imparting the Amunah. Because if you would have come and you would have spoken to the rock, 
And the rock would have given forth its waters in a natural way. They would have realized that you don't need a matta to make signs and wonders. All you need is, is the devar, the word of Moshe Rabbeinu, which is the word of Hashem. And the word of Hashem will travel with you into Eretz Yisrael. The word of our Kodesh Baruch will be with you in the fields. It'll be with you in Parnassus. It'll be with you in Shaduch. It'll be with you in your marriages. It'll be with you when you have to conquer the nation. It'll be with you. But because that you took that away, therefore says our Kodesh Baruch Hu, I take away your ability to lead Klal yourself into the wilderness. The greatest tragedy in the entire Chumash. The greatest man in history makes one small mistake. In the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's enormous and gigantic. And he loses all of his schus and all of his merits. 40 years of merits. 40 years of leading Klal Yisrael, 40 years of mitzvahs, 40 years of nevuah, 40 years of tefillah, of davening again and again and again to save the Jewish people from all their stubbornness. 40 years lost in an instant. And that's why the Ramban told his son that the worst need in the entire universe which you can have no part of in all of your life is kas, is anger because it will consume a person. Like the Gemara tells us, kol koyes, anybody that gets angry, is kila oivet avaydezar, as if they are worshiping idols. Kol koyes, anyone who gets angry, is tarif nafsha, they rip up their nefesh, they rip up their soul, they're not the person that they once were. If my Shabbatu could lose 40 years of schusim, imagine by us, who don't have that much schusim, we don't have 40 years of merits under our belt, imagine how much we could lose for our bouts of anger. Remember, my Shabbatu was kasha lichais, hard to anger, v'nayich l'ratzais, but he was very easy to appease. It was over like that. Most of us don't have that kind of angry streak. Most of us are noyach lichos. We're very easy to get angry. Vikasha l'ratzais, and we're very difficult to appease. Or we get angry semi-easily, and it takes a little time to get over the anger that is there. So what are we going to say to HaKadosh Baruch What are we going to say when we're standing on the edge? You know, one day everyone will be standing on the border between this world and the world to come. There's such a place, there's such a time in everybody's life. After 120 years, you'll be standing on the edge between Olam Haze and Olam Haba, this world and the world to come. And we want to be able to transition into becoming a Ben Olam Haba, a member of the world to come. We want to be able to transition into a place where we won't have the body anymore, we won't have the physicality anymore, we're going to have only ruchni, only spirituality. How will a person who is in, involved in a world of caste and a world of anger, how will they be able to transfer into that world? The only answer, the only advice is hasir kas mili bechel, like the Ramban said. Remove all anger from your heart. If you remove the anger that there is in your heart, so then a person is able to humble themselves. And that means that in my humility, I believe that everything that's happening in my life is only Ratzon Hashem. It's only the will of God. That means nobody can even hurt you unless HaKadosh Baruch Hu allows them to hurt you. You know, there are many children who hold grudges against their parents for lifetime, lifetime grudges, because their parents, once upon a time, did X, Y, and Z. They hold grudges against siblings, against aunts, against uncles, against rebbies, against teachers, against mothers. They hold it all their life, because this person did such X, Y, and Z. A person who gets to a place in their life where they realize 
that every single thing that's happening in my life, every person that comes my way, every situation that I end up going through is nothing less than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I can never hold the grudge against anybody. Heavy, we said this, we said this Chazal many times over the years, but it's a fascinating explanation. Heavy mekabel es kol adam b'seiv apanim yafais. You have to accept and greet every single person with a shining countenance, smile, happy to see you, welcome. It's so good to see you. Asks the asks not the meshachachma. Asks the uh, midrash Shmuel asks over there. And if the guy was mean to you. And if she was hurt your feelings, and he was a disaster, he was a terror, and he shamed your reputation, you're supposed to say, hi, how are you? So nice to see you. The answer is yes. Because if you believe in HaKadosh Baruch that everything that happens in your life is coming from Hashem, and Hashem would not bring a single person into your pathway that you're not supposed to encounter, and nobody could hurt you unless I go to Shabbat Shalom decreed and decided this person could do it. If you get angry at this person, who are you getting angry with? Get angry with Hashem. We have a right to be angry with Hashem. Hold the grudge against the Rebbe Hashem. Are you angry with Hashem when he puts money in the bank? Are you angry at Shabbat Shalom when he gives you a good, when you go to the doctor and you get a good, a good uh, bill of health? Are you angry with Hashem when you were walking your child down to the chuppah? and you're crying tears of joy, you were angry with Hashem? Were you angry at the bris of your grandchild or the bris of your own child? No. Were you angry when you were dancing in the chasana, when you went to a vort for one of your best friends and you were so elated for them? No. So why do we get angry with our Kodesh Baruch when things don't go the way that we want it to go? Says the Torah that if you really humbled yourself in front of our Kodesh Baruch Hu, and you really believed fully in Hashem, then you can't get angry with HaKadosh Baruch Hu because you realize Hashem don't make any mistakes. Hashem is perfect by definition and by nature, and everything that He does in your life is 1,000% absolute perfection. How can you be upset? How could you be angry? The only way you can be angry is, is because there's a little bit too much of yourself, too much of your own skin in the game. But if you would humble yourself, like the Ramban says, and you remove all cast from your heart, so then whatever comes your way, okay, not what I was expecting, but we're going to deal with it because our Kodesh Baruch is sending it my way. And if he wanted to send it to somebody else's address, he would have sent it there. You know, return to sender. Can't do that with Hashem's mail. He sent it to you. Now, the mailman, he knows exactly where he sent it to the right place. But in our world, where we're caught up with ourselves, unfortunately, we make those mistakes. Again, we're not, we're not, we're not criticizing Moshe Rabbeinu. We, not, we don't have the right to criticize Moshe and his actions. And Rav Hirsch is not criticizing Moshe Rabbeinu. Rav Hirsch over here says, let's conjecture what led to the sin of Moshe Rabbeinu over here. We don't want to criticize Moshe Rabbeinu. We are just positing over here what might have taken place in the mind of Moshe at that moment. Says Rav Hirsch, you know what it was? He got very disappointed in Kamal Yisrael. That after all of this time, you don't believe in me, you don't trust in me. How could such a thing be? But if a person, a person humbles, and Moshe Beno humbled himself all of the 40 years that they were in the Midbar, you know what it's like to, to have hundreds of thousands of people on your head all day long? You know the savlanas, the patience that a person has to have in order to deal with that? I remember there used to be, when we lived in the Shiva Lane, the, 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 the apartment next to us, so there was a, a woman that used to come and she was, um, she, she had like a, not a gun, but a daycare. And there were like 13 little kids in diapers in that one small little apartment. And you hear crying and screaming and whining and this and that. Could you, and this one was 
peaceful beyond mm -hmm. belief. Whenever you would see her, she was always <laughs> smiling. She was always at ease. Can you imagine the savants? That's 13, 12 little babies. Can you imagine one million whiny Jews in the wilderness for 40 years complaining? It's too hot. It's too cold. The food is not this. The food is not that. This is, you're in my seat. You're over here. This is not all, all the things that the Jews like. We take the food back. It's all the things that we complain about all of the time. Moshe Beinu didn't lose it once. Only this one time, Rav Hirsch says, because it affected him on a very deep emotional level. If they don't believe in me now, when will they ever believe in me? Says the Kodesh Baruch Hu, what do you expect? That is exactly who Klal Yisrael is. So if we will end up rising above the inertia of Kas, which is something that is unfortunately extremely, extremely prevalent. I was once, I was once someplace with a, call them, I guess, a middle-aged couple at the time. And uh, their shalom bias was never really something to write home about. It was actually something that was uh, concerning to most people that would ever see them. So they were, they were somewhere like on a vacation or something like that. And they were surrounded by family, friends, all different people. And the wife did something. It was a bit, of, it was careless. We can be honest over here. She did something that was quite careless. And somebody almost got hurt very badly as a result of it. And the husband went berserk. He went absolutely berserk. And in front of a large crowd of people, the man begins screaming and yelling at his wife. Amish, like, talk about kas, is Torah nafsha rips up this, the nefesh. There was no nefesh left by the time he got finished screaming at his wife. The woman was belittled. She was crying. She ran away. She's cursing out the ground that this man walks on. And she says, that's it. Over. Done. Finished. Can't take this anger anymore. Can't take this screaming and yelling anymore. Doesn't respect me. Doesn't, uh, do nothing. She's done. What's the end of the story? The end of the story is that this man was a sensitive fellow and he realized that he just made one of the biggest mistakes of his entire life. It's like, you scream and you yell at, yell at your wife like that, it's like hitting the rock not once, not twice. It's like hitting the rock a lot of times. And in front of the entire crowd that witnessed his debauchery of his wife, it's a good word? No, not really. Okay. He stands up and he says, I was wrong in the way in which I treated my wife, if I could allow myself to do such a terrible thing, it makes me realize how much help I need. Because I don't want to lose my wife. And I don't want to lose my children and my family and my friends. I'm really, really sorry. The wife starts crying, because now she really has to stay married to him. <laughs> she starts crying. Everyone's standing there like watching, whoa, this man is incredible. Within, I don't know, one, two days, something like that, he had, he had found the therapist that would end up saving his life. He went into serious therapy for cost and anger and all different things that he was dealing with. And today, I guarantee you that if you would see this couple today, you would never, ever know the low place that their shalom bias was in. Because they're relaxed, they're respectful, they laugh, they joke, they have a good time together, they honor each other, and they speak in a way that you, even if you try to pull the cast, the anger out of their mouth, you never ever hear it. Once that a person is willing to humble themselves that much, that it's my fault, it's not your fault. It's my problem, not your problem. HaGodesh Baruch runs the world in certain ways. You know, that in the, in the books of, in the Breslov Shalom Bayes books, the, the greatest thing that they say over there is that when the husband will realize that everything his wife does to drive him crazy, 
is all here to bring him the tikkun in his life because he must have been a sinner in a previous lifetime and therefore his neshama came back now into this world and he has to go through this great bashing from his wife but it's all a chesed from his wife he should realize that it's his fault that all this is happening. It has nothing to do with his wife. Let her go on and, and, and uh, berate him and do everything. When a person gets to that place and they realize that Hashem runs the world, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about the Rebbeinu Shaila. And they humble themselves to that point, like the Rabban says, that you cannot get angry. Then the Amuna is coursing and flowing through your bones and your veins before you react to any situation, right away you put it into perspective. Moshe Beno says, Rav Hirsch, he was the one that was supposed to lead Klal Yisrael into the land of Eretz Yisrael, the Amuna Shalema, because the only way they would survive the transition from miracles to regular life was the Amuna Shalema in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This one small thing that he did in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu was big, and he said, you didn't create the ultimate amunah and the Kiddush Hashem that you were supposed to, and therefore, you're not going into Eretz Yisrael. Now, Be'ez Hashem Yisbarach, we will dig inside of ourselves. Everybody has people or situations or events or places that cause the anger to well up inside of them. It behooves each and every one of us to make an effort especially during these days as we are approaching the, the, the three weeks of Shivasa Batamas to Tishabov, where it's a time of strife amongst Klal Yisrael. Anger is division and derision and strife. A person can pick maybe one of those people in their life that they allow to get under their skin and they will often find a way to get angry at them Perhaps during this time of the year, we'll work on rectifying that relationship. We're working on our humility, which will lead us to the savlanis, the patience. Patience allows you not to react immediately, and then you don't have to get angry. When you hold back and you pause before the words come out of your mouth, before the blood begins to boil, before you lunge, you're not going to be able to get angry or to express that anger in the world. And in that zechos, in Yetz Hashem, although Moshe, maybe it'll be the tikkun of the chait of Moshe Rabbeinu, that although Moshe Rabbeinu, because of the fact that he got a, just a drop angry, HaKadosh Baruch Hu barred him from going into Eretz Yisrael, if we're misakin this chait within ourselves of our own of inab inabilities to sometimes hold back in our anger, but to control it, during this time of the year, then Be'ez HaShem Yisbarach, even though Moshe did not get into Eretz Yisrael, HaKadosh Baruch will bring each and every one of us into Eretz Yisrael. The Simcha B'Tuv Leif, singing and dancing in Yerushalayim, Yerach Kodesh, in Hei Rav Yavim. All the way to question, Rabbi? Yes. I fully understand why Moshe reached his exhaustion point. They, they're, we remember the fresh fish in Egypt, or there, were there not enough graves in Egypt? Last week, the Korach rebellion, and as part of the rebellion, they said, you promised to bring us in there to sell milk and honey, and you never spot us there. He did not bring them there, despite many, many examples where he didn't lose his cool at all, okay? Jewish people have the golden calf, Jewish people have the Korach rebellion, all these people, and God ultimately comes and forgives, including last week, they, they saved the copper pans that were part of the rebellion. It's an amazing thing, okay? And, and the golden calf saved the, the partial ends in forgiveness. I don't understand how God cannot forget that. This is the guy that listened to you every single word, begged on behalf of the Jewish people, don't kill them, don't slaughter them. You know, I don't, I don't want it to be just Moshe's descendants. Keep the Jewish people. And God listens and God does listen. But where's the, where's the <laughs> forgiveness? I mean, I, you're right to ask such a question. And the, the simple answer is, is that Hashem holds the very righteous to a different set of rules and judgments. And although that for the rest of Claudius, so they sinned by the golden calf, which was 
catastrophic. And they complained about this and they complained about that. And they sent in the Miraglim, which was catastrophic, a destruction of the history of the Jewish people. Israel. Nevertheless, HaKadosh Baruch Hu can forgive. But when a person on the Madrega of Moshe Rabbeinu makes a mistake, which again, if we would have done it, Hashem would have tolerated it, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But in Moshe Rabbeinu's world of spiritual greatness, it's, there's not the room, the wiggle room, to make such a mistake like that where you, you, where you express your anger in public to the Jewish people when you were supposed to use the opportunity to teach them a moon and be makadashem shemayim. That's something that a Kodesh Baruch says, it, it cannot get my forgiveness. And therefore you are punished that you can't go to Eretz Yisrael. He tries later on, we'll see in Bajva Askan, and he tries to daven to Hashem that Hashem should forgive him. And he got so close, Hashem said, Stop. Because if you try one more, I'm going to have to forgive you, but I can't. Because my mind is already made up in this particular thing. You missed the opportunity to get Claudius already for the ultimate transition to Eretz Yisrael, and it's gone now. And they're not ready. And therefore, you're not going to be the one to take them in. I think it's a, it, it throws back also that Moshe's, to me, Ruan, a much bigger heir would seem to be is breaking the Ruchas. He's, he's applauded for breaking the Ruchas. <clears throat> so the last, he is applauded for breaking the Ruchas. The last Rashi in Chumash says that Yasha Kaychacha Kashia Shibarta Shkayach Maisha You broke the Ruchas because this nation is not worthy of having them. Rashi. No, he, he, but he didn't. It wasn't his temper. He wasn't angry. It was. It was for the sake of Hashem. He said, "Hakadosh Baruch Hu, is it possible that this nation that just did Har Sinai is dancing around the golden calf, worshiping an idol, which is the first and the second of the Sarah Sadibas are all believe in Hashem and don't worship idols? So how can we give the Torah to them? They don't deserve it." So out of the honor and the glory of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, smashed the Lucas, Hashem said, Yashukayich, you did the right thing. I agree with you. It's also a slap in the face of the Jewish people. It's also about. that creation. Yes. Away from what the whole shir, that Moshe struck the rock. Why was him in previous interpretations as well? Yeah, I, the reference has a whole thing over here as well. About why Aaron Akhlein is held is held guilty also. It's it's a lesser to a lesser degree of what he did, but we see that they were we see that they were they were together over here. I have to I have to get back to you on that one. Good question. Anybody else? Yeah. What? Yeah, but he it was it was just for it was just for the to show that Hakadosh Baruch was the one that was leading them there. If Moshe stands up in front of all clouds and he's holding on to the staff, he, and he assumes that famous position that they remembered from years ago. He looks like the emissary of Hashem. What ended up being part of the challenge that he was in was that once he had the staff in his hand, he's not supposed to use it. Anybody else? Yeah. So in addition to working on Kaz within myself as a tikkun for this, I also can't help but feel a little bit guilty because we somewhat provoked him with our own lack of emuna. And that's, and that's helpful because if I think today of, look, Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest person, humblest person, we were able to bring him to anger, and he lost that chelik in going to Eretz Yisrael. It's, it, yes, he, he was held to a higher level, but at the same time, our lack of emuna and complaining is really what kind of pushed him to that place. Correct. But Hashem is saying, he shouldn't have let it push you. No, he shouldn't have let it, but also me today. Yeah, yes. I can also, I mean, we were also wrong. You know, 100%. Yeah, we were course. also wrong. Yeah. And then 
we've and then I feel bad for Moshe Rabbeinu because of course yes he's on a higher level and he shouldn't have done that he needed to do the kiddush Hashem and to inspire our emuna but then there's also I feel like some level of guilt like oh yes we know he's held to such a high level but only because of our own lack of emuna was he provoked thus correct I mean, still was, was, it, was, it was our chesed it was our it was our Shortcoming as well. Sure. Sure. Okay. We'll see you next week. Be'ez Hashem.